30, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so, um, I'm sending a message on where to be. So this meeting is being recorded and it will be available on their website um, 20, within 24 hours. Um, so now I'm, I move that um, that we call the meeting of the Arlington Electoral Board um, to order on March 14th at 5.30 p.m. Thank you, Rich. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Okay, and so now we have the minutes from the previous meeting. Um, Scott, I don't know if you had a chance to yes, review these. Online, yes, okay, right. fabulous. Um, so I move that um, the minutes from the February 4th meeting be approved. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Thank you. All right, and so our next order of business is reorganization. So per Virginia code, um, oh, before I do that, I want to say welcome to everyone. Sorry, I'm, we have a big, we have a pretty large agenda, so I'm moving through here. But welcome everyone who is here in the room and who has joined us virtually. Welcome to the uh, electoral board meeting. So now we are going to go into reorganization. So per Virginia Code 24.2-107, um, the electoral board is required to meet in March. Um, historically, this is because the board needed to reorganize following the appointment of a new member. So we are now going to open the floor for nominations for chair. Madam Chair, <laughs> yes, thank you for your past service. You've done so very well, but I would like to nominate you, hoping you'll be reelected by acclamation, nominate you for another well earned term for this calendar year of 2023. Thank you. Second that. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> thank you. And now I'm going to move that we uh, open the floor for nominations for the vice chair. And I would like to uh, nominate Rich Sam for vice chair. Second. Great, All in, great <laughs> <laughs> I've done that for many years. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yeah. And I'm also now going to uh, move, open the floor for Secretary Scott. If you would like the position. <laughs> <laughs> I would be honored. I would be honored to serve the two of you and I would all of you. Thanks. <laughs> Rich, second that. Um, and all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So we have now officially reorganized. Thank you very much. So now election officer appointment. So we got a list of appointments. So first is the list of applicants since the last meeting. So there's nine people okay. on there that we need to appoint. All right. And then we did receive a list from the GOP. Um, it had six names on it, but only four had applied and were in our database. So we just need to appoint those to serve as okay. Republican appointments. All right, so appointing the four that, are, that have applied and have applications. So then the GOP would need to follow up on the mm -hmm. other two and make sure that they apply. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. We were um, only given addresses. We weren't given email or phone numbers. So. Okay. Okay. That's 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 good to know. So. All right. Yes. Did you didn't get a list from the Democratic Committee? No. Not in ten days before the meeting. But keep in mind, there's a ro rolling deadline. So. All right, so I'm going to um, move that the list of election officers provided uh, be appointed for a term commencing immediately and terminating on March 31st, 2024. And that does not include the, um, the additions of, on the GOP list of people who have not applied yet. Second that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, Kate does have some numbers if you're interested in overall numbers. Yes. Okay. So currently we have um, 30 uh, on our list that are nominated from the 
GOP, 25 have accepted their appointment so far, 36 from the Democratic Party, 33 of those have accepted their nomination so far, and then unaffiliated, uh, we have 2,039 of those 752 have accepted their appointment for this next year so far. And is that likely to be enough for? Oh, definitely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for those numbers. We have a lot. We have a lot of elections. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we're looking at maybe 250, 300 for the primary and then 450, 500 for the general election. Um, and then we, yet to be determined on the Republican primary for next year uh, for president, should there be one. Okay. Okay. So let's go ahead and uh, move on to the next item, which is legislative updates. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to highlight three bills. Um, all of them have been sent to the governor, so we are waiting for the governor to sign. Um, Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, but he has until March 27th yes. to sign. Um, so uh, as you might be aware, this was a short session this year, which means that uh, legislators were limited in how many bills they could introduce. Um, so we didn't see a ton of activity, um, at least in terms of elections. Some years we've seen as many as 60 bills passed. Um, this year, the fact that we're only highlighting three um, really indicates what kind of session it was. Um, it's also important to note that this year, both um, houses of the General Assembly are up for election and they cannot campaign while the General Assembly is in session. So my impression is that everybody was pretty eager to get out of session so they, they could start campaigning, especially if they had primary challengers this year. Um, so that um, kind of highlights the backstory of what happened this legislative session. Um, and if Scott has anything else to add. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm probably I'm sorry about that. This was when I parked my car. It was one of those about once a year when I'm asked for my password for my parking mobile. So, <laughs> uh, but yes, yeah, so you just uh, I'll go home. It's finished. Uh, <laughs> probably the direction you described the session well, um, and I would expect that the governor would sign the measures you mentioned. Mm -hmm. As we talked about in our previous meeting, there were a number of other bills that passed the House, didn't pass the Senate as expected. And the result of that is putting a number of things in place that we have have realized and dealt with effectively and they will continue at least for another year and with respect to the redistricting the latest count that i have is that uh, as a result partly of retirements uh, some expected because of longevity of service and and also others because of the combining of members into districts that was done by the Supreme Court because they didn't know the addresses, which I think was a good thing. Didn't know the addresses of legislators when they drew the districts. The nonpartisan commission process didn't work. Uh, we now have an accumulated 485 years of legislative service that will be departing. And uh, we will see that the Democrats have expressed the preference statewide uh, as I understand it, for primaries, Republicans are still using in some jurisdictions a convention or a canvas method, some places primaries. Uh, and so we will have much campaigning going on just as members were, I can assure you, ready to come home from the regular session. They'll be ready to reconvene for the reconvene session April 12th and finish as much as possible. So meeting literally to call the moving bands if they haven't already to move their, to move their residences to where they want to run in preparing for the 45 day period of early voting before the primary and then on to the general. So an extra busy election year, more work for us and more opportunities to involve voters and support candidates of your choice. Thanks. So with the three bills that um, I've chosen to highlight today, um, so one of them uh, establishes a standard of seven days to uh, report uh, results by precinct for both early and mail voting. Last year it was made a requirement that we separate out early votes and mail vote, votes by precinct, but they didn't tell us when we had to do that. Um, by and so there was some disagreement of well as long as it's done by December we're okay um, the or it doesn't need to be done election night 
Well, this year the General Assembly has set the time frame of you have to have it done within seven days of the election, um, which is when certification is. So, so that's the background of that bill. Um, also, one of the bills that has passed uh, waiting for the governor is that it will allow voters to um, include the last four digits of their social security number and date of birth in lieu of a witness signature on their mail ballot. Um, should they be in a position where they don't have somebody to witness them signing their mail ballot. Um, that and that was a recommendation a couple of years ago. There was a, the General Assembly set up a working group to explore um, alternatives to a witness signature, and that was one of the recommendations that came out of that working group. Um, the final bill, um, it requires the Department of Elections to draft standards for recounts of contests with more than one winner. Um, this bill has come out of uh, something that happened in the city of Fairfax last fall. Um, they had five uh, county board members or county council mem city council members um, up for election last year and the uh, candidates five and six were within recount threshold, but there were no recount standards drafted for how to handle a race when you had five candidates being elected. Um, traditional recount standards only dealt with two candidates and so all the candidates had to agree to the recount and the candidate who was first or fourth didn't want to agree to the recount. Um, so this has kind of it put them in a little bit of a legal precarious situation. So that's the backstory of this bill and how it re uh, applies to Arlington directly is obviously we're getting ready to go into a county board race where we have more than one county board seat on the ballot and uh, with ranked choice voting. So the Department of Elections is also including recount standards um, for this type of race as well. Okay. And so um, Gretchen, if when these are signed, when they go in effect for the general? Yeah, so um, most of them go, unless somebody puts in a delayed enactment clause, they'll go into effect on July 1st of this year. Um, but neither, uh, none of them have a delayed enactment, so. I'm happy to add one more thing that when, pardon me, when in the Privileges and Elections Committee of the House, there were defeated measures which would have extended ranked choice voting to constitutional offices and also at the federal level, a delegate from Accomac, Accomac on the Eastern Shore, Delegate Bloxham, said that he was waiting along with his colleagues, um, as we expressed with the county board, waiting uh, along with his colleagues to see how well Lincoln does with the ranked choice voting for the for the board. So no pressure, Gretchen. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. And that's where Scott McCaffrey got his got his headline, the eyes, the eyes of the Commonwealth or a fun all, which is exactly how it is. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> um so while we're talking about the budget meeting, did you want to do a quick recap of our budget hearing? Yes, uh, I represent gave a great presentation um, and I remotely uh, and I was able to be here in person. She did a wonderful job. I was very impressed by the knowledge that the board members had mm -hmm. of what we were going to be presenting. They've done their homework along with the county manager. We're very interested as you would expect, particularly in the ranked choice voting and uh, could not have been more supportive in terms of wanting us to have everything we need um, working with all of you mm -hmm. to uh, have a successful election year and we were we were i'm glad we were fourth yes on <laughs> yes fourth on the <laughs> on the roster um i arrived here um, that after three o'clock and gretchen was thinking to be on by four we were and then i had a meeting out in leesburg and by the time I got there for a, for a six o'clock meeting, I was still listening uh, to uh, Paul yeah, Ferguson. It was up. It went on a long time. <laughs> and, and in fact, the county board, that's what they're doing right now down yeah. the hall. So I'm glad we could be on the day we were. It went very well. And I thought it was very encouraging to, and, and the board was certainly very complimentary of Gretchen and the staff and my colleagues mm -hmm. working together to make things work. Mm -hmm. Any comment or comments from you? <laughs> yeah, so the um, yeah, the majority of the questions were about ranked choice voting and implementation. Um, so that definitely is the focus of the county board, um, which I think makes sense going into this year. And um, we do, they are being very supportive and anything that we need, it does sound like we will have be able to get their support. So, yeah. 
So it's got, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so candidate filing information. Oh, wait, I skipped one. Early mm -hmm. voting locations and hours for the primary. So on the screen, um, we have the recommended hours. This is based on the hours that we used uh, for the primaries during the last two years. So um, uh, courthouse obviously is open May 5th to June 17th, and then we would open up additional sites on Tuesday, June 13th and Thursday, June 15th from 2 to 7 p.m. And then we'd be open up at those sites the two Saturdays. We are uh, required to be open two Saturdays, um, so we would be open from 9 to 5 at all three locations those last two Saturdays. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, I did pull some data on how many voters we saw at each um, early voting site uh, during the primary of 2021 and 2022 to show you a little bit what what turnout looked like. Mm. So. So I would say no site was at any point overwhelmed. Yeah. Yeah, with that last Saturday always being like the busiest, yeah. busiest day. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that's that's fine. I know we um, Sunday hours. We're gonna save those for the primary, for the, for the general. Fall. Sorry, the yeah. general election. Okay. Yeah. And we hadn't done Sunday last year or the year before. Okay. So, and when we are open on Sundays. For the general, um, we would get around 400 per site. Um, okay. That's on average. And don't quote me on that. I don't have the spreadsheet in front of me. So. <laughs> All right. Um, so um, um, I move that the extended hours and days for the satellite voting locations for the 2023 Democratic primary on June 20th. Thank you. So yeah, as follows, so Tuesday. Oh, sorry, you can. The dates, the dates, per the dates on the slide, which is a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> and the slides will be made available. Yes. <laughs> And we'll update our website with this information. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So we have uh, early voting location and hours for the Democratic primary, and um, then the primary itself is going to be on June 20th. So question for you, because the, the Juneteenth holiday that Monday. Yep. How does, is it going to work with the mail-in ballots for this year? Um, so, June, so we're required to be open the day before an election um, until 2 p.m. in case um, anybody needs to vote an emergency ballot. So this is somebody who had a death in the family or a work emergency that they learned about after noon on the Saturday, Saturday June 17th. And so we, like I said, we open up um, until 2 p.m. for them to be able to cast an emergency ballot. Um, and then we do, we have historically just gone ahead and closed to the public at 2 p.m. Um, since we have fulfilled our legal requirements at that point. Um, in terms of mail, um, we will get mail on Saturday. And then uh, because we can accept mail ballots through Friday at noon, um, we don't anticipate it showing significant delays. Monday's a pretty light mail day anyway, since they don't pick up mail on our process mail on Sundays. So Tuesday's always our heavier mail day. So. Does that help you? That, that does. Thank yeah, you. Madam Chair, it seems to me that this year is appropriate for this year, and we can certainly do what do what we whatever we can do and do whatever anyone on the on the uh, call can do to help promote the the hours and locations. And again, adjusting things as makes sense for a given election year. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll we'll be in good shape. Yeah. I agree. And also, if both both the political parties could help to promote the hours, uh, and what their process is, that would be maybe 
appreciate it. Thanks. All right. So now we're going to move on to candidate file information. So um, we received the official call to order for primaries. Um, and uh, so we'll, we will have a Democratic, a Democratic Party has been called for and all of the seats on the ballot this year. So that's all House and Senate seats where you have three Senate seats, sorry, two Senate seats and three House seats. Um, then we have the Commonwealth Attorney and Clerk of the Court, which we share with the City of Falls Church. And then um, here in Arlington, we have Treasurer, Commissioner of Revenue, Sheriff, and County Board. Um, two seats for the County Board. Um, candidates have until March 20th, or sorry, they can't start, they can't file until March 20th, um, and they'll file with the Democratic Party. Um, and then they have until April 6th to file. Um, they do need to file some paperwork with us. There's been a lot of confusion over who files what where. We have a lot of new candidates this year, so we just wanted to emphasize that they do, if you're running in that Democratic primary, you need to file some stuff with the General Registrar or Department of Elections if you're running for one of those General Assembly seats. Um, you need to pay a fee to the treasurer of the locality where you live, and then you'll need to file with the party chair um, all of your paperwork um, that the party chairs require. Um, and then uh, we also have, we haven't had, we have had school board candidates file with us. Um, as a reminder, all school board candidates are independent candidates. <coughs> so they have a filing window of June 2nd, or January 2nd to June 20th. Um, and they would file all of their paperwork with our office. So, yeah. and that goes for independent candidates as well. And um, this, and also a question that has come up is all campaigns need to file a statement of organization and need to be filing campaign finance reports. So if you are running for office and you have spent a penny or somebody has donated a penny, you need to make sure you are filing campaign finance reports. I really can't emphasize that enough. Okay. Madam Chair, if I could thank, thank Gretchen and, and uh, great staff for having a very impressive attendance with a, a wonderful member of the State Board of Elections that my colleagues and I had the opportunity to attend. It was very, uh, very timely and effective and I happened to be visiting with that staff member in Richmond on another matter and mm -hmm. she appreciated the invitation up here. I thought that was great public service for candidates and the parties from throughout Northern Virginia to have the opportunity to attend and was made even more so impressive because um, the power went out <laughs> that morning. So she she knew it so well she could do it along with Gretchen in the dark. Oh. And also thinking thinking back quickly over four year cycles as far back as I can recall at the moment, uh, I believe this is the, the uh, greatest number of candidates we had on a primary ballot mm -hmm. in, yeah. many, in many seasons. And again, that's an opportunity to opportunity to make the process work. Yes. Thanks. And so here are the candidates who have filed something with our office. Once again, nobody has been able to file with the party yet, and so nobody has qualified to be on the ballot. Um, so there is still the possibility that somebody won't be able to raise the funds to pay their filing fee or something like that. So. I mean, if you don't see a candidate on there, that means they probably haven't filed anything yet with us. So, yep. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, ranked choice voting. Okay. So we have a newly minted voter outreach and education plan, which we will put on our website and include for people to use. So um, we've received a lot of questions about what are we going to do for outreach and education? Um, so that is why we put together the, this um, very good looking plan. Um, hopefully the content is as good as well. So um, we are, uh, so the plan will have four goals, um, which is essentially to provide, uh, to prepare voters to know how to mark their ballot, um, provide information on the background of ranked choice voting and why Arlington has adopted this method, uh, provide detailed information on tabulation, 
um, and when results will be reported. And then we want to ensure that our community outreach partners um, and community outreach partners, any one of our election officers, League of Women Voters, Democratic Party, anybody who's going to be going out into the community and talking about ranked choice voting, we want to make sure that they're trained and have the tools needed to educate the public on using ranked choice voting in Arlington County. So we are targeting four different audiences with our outreach plan. Um, voters, we're going to focus on how to mark your ballot and why we're using ranked choice voting. Um, election officers and outreach partners, we're going to focus a little bit more nuanced in how to talk about people about how to mark their ballot, uh, why we're implementing ranked choice voting, and then some, some a very high level overview of tabulation and how that will occur. Um, we have a third group, candidates in the media, um, which will go into a little bit more detail on tabulation. How are we going to choose a winner? And when are we going to choose a winner? Um, and then uh, we're calling the fourth group our election enthusiasts. I want to call them election nerds, but I was overruled. <laughs> um, so, um, so as uh, we pointed out, there's a lot of interest in ranked choice voting in Arlington County and Virginia and even nationally. We've had people from as far away as Hawaii. Um, wanting to learn more about how Arlington's implementing ranked choice voting. Um, so we're going to um, create some some training and outreach tools specifically for this. It's really going to do it more of a deep dive into things like logic and accuracy testing. What does that look like? How are we doing that? Um, auditing the election um, and some of that legislative process that we went through to get ranked choice voting here in Arl Arlington. So, but voters don't need to know all of that. So, yeah. Um, so in terms of where we are right now on the plan, um, we are working with the Department of Elections to create a suite of out outreach tools, uh, materials, sorry, uh, social media messages, training videos, and things like that. Um, we are hoping to see those in the first week in April. Um, we will officially launch our outreach program on April 12th, which is when the county is doing an open house for our brand new, uh, new brand new renovated building. Um, so you can mark that date on your calendar because that's when we'll definitely be having our first kickoff event. Um, and then we'll be doing a lot more trainings in April and May as we lead for that June 20th election. Okay. Any questions? Like I said, you can have my copy. <laughs> it's a take home. What time on April 12th? Three to six. Three to six. Mary. I have a question that has to do with the uh, logistics and how things are going to work inside the polling site. Yep. Is now an appropriate time for that kind of question? Um, yeah. Okay. We well, might not have an answer, but we will what? take the question. <laughs> <laughs> will there be two separate paper ballots that people complete? One for the you only get one choice and one for the ranked choice. And will those same ballots go into the same scanner, but just triggered by different or triggering different software? So the like so obviously it depends on how many candidates qualify um, for ballot length. Um, but right now we're looking at having one ballot card that is front and back. So the front will have all of the constitutional offices left it through plurality, and the back will have the county board office using that ranked choice voting method. So it's one sheet of paper, just front and back. And it goes into the scanner and it's read on both sides. Yes, yeah, it takes yeah, the scanners point. take a picture of both sides of the ballot. They do this all the time anyway. Um, yeah. Great. So. Thank you. And it's not uncommon. We would probably have a two sided ballot anyway, given the number of candidates that we have. Ranked choice voting aside, we'd probably be looking at a two side ballot anyway for this election. Yeah. Gretchen, what I've been trying to do yeah. my early education effort in talking <laughs> yeah. to people, um, one thing that, that has surprised people that I've talked to a little bit is the fact that unlike normal years in the past when we've had the, the two seats up, you only get one vote instead of two votes. Yeah. And so I would would hope that that could be part of the educational yeah. effort so no, people absolutely. don't come in and say, wait a second, how come I'm only getting one first place vote instead of two? Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's a really good point, and we'll definitely emphasize that. So does everyone understand what Rich is talking about? So instead of a vote for two, um, it's one, two, three. Um, and a lot of that just has to do with the, the how ranked choice voting works. 
Um, so, and you couldn't have the two separate offices because if somebody's the first choice in both of those, how do you go? Anyway, it, it has to all be contained. Um, and there, there's a reason for why it is done that way. So, yeah. And one more question. As voters come in to vote from the early voting from May 5th on all the way through June 20th, Will there be some very simple cheat sheet that people, voters can, who would have really focused on it until they're voting, be given if they are confused and not know what they're yeah. doing? Yeah, our intention is to try to capture them before they get into the voting booth so that we can walk, answer all of their questions prior to them being given the ballot. Because once they're given the ballot, any assistance, any real detailed assistance we provide, they would have to fill out a request for assistance form. Mm -hmm. So our goal is to try, we're going to try to capture the questions before they check in and are given their ballot. So, yep. I assume you're making detailed instructions for vote by mail people. Yes. 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 I'm sure everybody has suggested I would expect. Um, or expect that one of, if not the, the most uh, frequent question, will be, do they have to vote mm -hmm. for three? Uh, it was interesting, that was very much on the minds of legislators in Richmond. And of course, as, as much as they were to be up to date on things, it was an education that no, you don't have to, you can vote for however many you want, or you can not even vote for that office if you, if you don't want to. So um, I'm sure that it's probably the top of your list. Mm -hmm. But just thought that uh, message from Richmond might be of <laughs> that's that's interest. Good, that's a good point. Yeah. And also, if if, um, if you could send this excellent piece to us, absolutely. Um, and also to anyone else here who would like mm -hmm. to have it, that would be helpful. Yep. Uh, I've been invited to speak to the Columbus Club oh, uh, next month, and this yep. would be very helpful. Yep. Along with your other good pieces. Yep. Great. And the and um, the reason why it's it's Three, just to kind of remind everyone is the, the limitations on the software. So in order to do more than three, uh, we would either have to uh, upgrade, well, we upgrade our equipment or replace our equipment, um, both of which are difficult with supply chain shortages, um, given the time frame that we have. But we are looking to do that as soon as the opportunity presents itself. So. Any other questions about right choice voting? Which, I have one question. You mentioned training for those of us who might be educated. Do you have an idea when you would be offering that? April. Mm -hmm. just and there will be more than one. There will be, it's not, yeah, there will be more than one session. So, okay, great. Yeah. Okay, will that be posted on the website yes. as well? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, um, um, and one of the things, so can you pull up the website very quick? So one of the things, so we're launching, re, um, reactivating, I should say, rather than launching, but we're reactivating our email list. Um, so you can go to our website and subscribe. Tanya's going to show you how to do that real quick. And you can subscribe to receive an email list. And so we will, our first email will go out um, with this outreach plan to everybody who has subscribed to that list. And then that's where We'll really be targeting more of the uh, like high level deep or the deep dives into rank choice voting. So if you go to our website, which is vote.arlingtonva.gov, and you scroll all the way to the bottom, right here under Stay Informed, uh -huh. if you click Sign Up for the newsletter, it's going to lead you here, and then you just click this Submit Your Email Here to Subscribe button, and then you add your email address. Mm -hmm. And this is the same email subscription list that the whole county uses. So if you're subscribed to any other updates on parks facilities or anything like that, um, it's that same. So. Okay. And this is where we will be emailing out about electoral board meetings in the future too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so. We were uh, essentially we were waiting for that button to be created. We were moved to a website ahead of the rest of the county and they didn't give us a so we had to deactivate our list and so now we're just reactivating it. So okay, thank you for that, Tony. Yeah, thank you. All right, so the next um, 
item on our list on our agenda here is the drop box and uh, i know we have a presentation so can you find us starting with that presentation yep if i can just mention one yes. one thing yeah uh, just so every, everyone is here depending not sure how long everyone will need to stay but like for you all to know that uh, arlington has an outstanding member now on the state board of elections our former colleague matt weinstein was appointed by the governor and he will be serving along with uh, another distinguished virginian former state senator from petersburg rosalind dance and uh, i think that uh, matt will serve very well seeing as he served well here and a good op op opportunity for Arlington to uh, through him render further service to the commonwealth in a manner in which we would expect and and he will do Mm -hmm. So if the minister could reflect that, I'd appreciate it. With my congratulations. Absolutely. Thanks. Okay. All right. So at the next slide, please. At the last uh, electoral board meeting, um, I was asked to present on several different topics around the use of mail ballot drop boxes here in Arlington. Um, here's a list of some of the questions that I was asked during that meeting. Um, so I wanted to start today by going to the uh, taking everyone back to the summer of 2020 when Arlington first started using drop boxes. So that summer there was a general national anxiety about the election, but also about the ability for the United States Post Office to handle the influx of mail ballots. Uh, processing plants were closing, standard delivery timeframes were expanded. Um, and while there is credence to these stories, the truth is that mail ballots represent a very small portion of mail processed by the Postal Service. A dramatic increase in requests for mail ballots was really just a blip in their numbers. Um, for context, the Postal Service processes 425.3 million pieces of mail an hour. In 2020, they processed 135 million ballots which basically equates to around 20 minutes worth of work for them over the course of a year. So not a, not like, well, a huge volume for us, not much for the Postal Service. So any um, stories that you've heard about the um, uh, uh, increase in vote by mail causing a complete collapse of the United States Postal Service, probably not gonna happen. With that said, um, what we saw that summer is we did receive credible reports of ballots being lost in Arlington during the June and July elections that year. We also knew that we were getting slammed with mail re with requests for mail ballots. So we ended up mailing out more than 49,000 mail ballots <laughs> in that initial mail out in 2020. So we had uh, going into that uh, November election, we had essentially a perfect storm. Um, we knew ballots were getting lost in Arlington and we knew we had a record increase or request for mail ballots for that election. Um, next slide. So our only goal in 2020 was really to ensure that every voter was fully able to participate in the election and have confidence that their vote would count regardless of how they chose to cast it, whether that be early, by mail, or on election day. And we didn't want to dictate or encourage one system or the over, or over another. All were safe, secure, and would count. So that's where Dropbox has introduced the scene. So next slide. Um, so in August 2020 that year, the General Assembly allowed it, officially allowed use of 24 hour drop boxes in Virginia. These boxes were and always have been optional for localities. The change did require, the change in code did require staffed or monitored drop boxes at every early voting location and at election day polling places. Um, prior to this, voters could hand deliver their mail ballot to the journal registrar, so me personally. So we did allow <laughs> ballots to be dropped off at our office. Uh, by the time the 24-hour the drop boxes were authorized in August that year, um, supplies were extremely limited and we had very few options. Um, our vendor had 14 boxes left by the time we contacted them and we uh, purchased nine of them. So the decision for placement um, in uh, the fall of 2020, uh, we first placed them at the five early voting locations we had that year. So we had Courthouse, Madison and Walter Reed, but we also had Langston Brown and Aurora Hills Community Center. 
We then use the four remaining boxes to fill in the geographic gaps so that no voter was more than two miles from a drop box. We also were limited on where we could place them based on who wanted to give us a drop box. Um, and we also needed to be plugged into the county building and uh, network so that we could have video on these drop boxes. So thankfully, Libraries was a great partner, which is why three of the four boxes are at Westover Central and Sherlington Library. And then that fourth box is um, the West End of Columbia Pike at Arlington Mill Community Center because I really was the only facility on that end of the county. OK, does that explain placement? All right. The number of nine drop boxes is consistent. Oh, sorry, voters were notified about the drop boxes um, uh, with information placed on our website, but also included with their instructions on how to cast their mail ballot. Um, the number nine is consistent with the national recommendation to have run Dropbox for every 10,000 voters. Next slide. Um, by this stat, we should actually have 17 Dropboxes in Arlington. Because we are geographically tiny and not a vote by mail state, I think we can all agree that 17 Dropboxes in Arlington would probably be overkill. <laughs> but when you compare Arlington to the Metro DC region, um, the number of drop boxes we have is in line with both Maryland and DC and some of the smaller cities in Virginia, such as Fairfax, Falls Church and Manassas. So if you can see here, we have one drop box for every 19,000 voters. And that compares to Maryland, DC and those smaller cities. OK. Next slide, any. Okay. The upfront cost of drop boxes, both procurement and installation, was paid for with federal funding from the American Rescue Plan, which provided COVID relief to localities. Ongoing costs have been absorbed into our operating budget and to the budgets of the Department of Environmental Services. Um, uh, the ongoing costs consist of, we have two employees, assistant registrars, complete the runs. The run takes about two hours a day and they're paid on average $19 an hour. And this translates to $76 per day, which ends up being uh, $3,500 per election. Uh, the drop boxes are not regular to regularly monitored in between elections. So the cost is only during those 43 days that we're picking them up during an election. The cost is partially offset. Um, and that we don't have to pay for ballots that are returned using them. So Arlington has a business reply mail permit in place for mail ballots. And this means that we're only charged for ballots returned through the United States Postal Service. And that's about a dollar a ballot. So every ballot that goes into the drop box is a savings from our postal budget of a dollar. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that cost of return postage was reimbursed to localities in 2020 and 2021 by the General Assembly. That reimbursement was not provided last year in 2022, and I do not uh, believe it will be, we will ever be reimbursed for return postage. Um, we'll see, but I don't believe so. Um, so at the presentation we had last month, um, costs were highlighted as a primary concern, and there really are two ways to reduce costs. Um, the first is to remove drop boxes altogether. They are optional. Uh, the second is to reduce the days that they are open. So we estimate that it will cost around $2,500 to remove a drop box, and this cost includes removing it, repairing the sidewalk, um, the concrete, storing it, and then reinstalling the drop box. Um, should we want to reinstall it during the next election? Um, if we reduce the days that we're picking up drop boxes to just the last two weeks, uh, we could potentially see a cost savings of around $2,000. Um, some localities that we looked at in the DC area, uh, they did only open them the last week before the election. I did read stories though of places that did this when they went to open them. They found people had been trying to get their ballots in there. 
um, prior to them opening. So there is a county in Pennsylvania when they went to open them. Well, they found 13 ballots in their drop box already. So voters found a way, even though they're locked secured, they found a way to get their ballots in there. So. Um, so in our analysis, reducing the number of boxes uh, presented a negligible cost savings. It doesn't take that much longer to drive to all nine drop boxes versus having to get from Wall three in our Madison. That's going to take you an hour and an hour and a half, depending on what time of day you go. Does that make sense? It just takes two hours to drive across Arlington from one end to the other. John? Yes. How much of that removal cost is the cost of reinstallation? Because it seems to me reinstallation is not removal. Yeah. Uh, I think it was maybe $500 because keep in mind they're drilled into the sidewalk. So when we remove them, you have to repair that concrete. Right. And then transportation and storage. So that was the bulk of the cost. So reinstallation would only be $500 a I, I have to look at the estimate. Yeah. Well, although 500. removal is what, 2000 Yeah, because they have to go in and jackhammer the concrete and get them up. Mm. And then and then relay them. It's much easier to drill a hole into concrete than to remove it and replace the concrete. That's right. Uh, Gretchen, can you tell us? Uh, thinking a lot along the same course there, se separating the removal and then the replay replacing them there, putting them back. Uh, where, if if some were taken out, where would they be stored? I spoke with the member of DTS to to walk through these costs and they said that they would be able to find storage for us at one of the county facilities to make sure they were secured. So he said that they believe they had storage space at one of our facilities here in Courthouse Plaza. Um, and then I was able to find the breakdown. So removal and the patch of concrete itself is $1,500. A reinstallation per, per drop box. Yes. Reinstallation of $500 and then the delivery and storage of $500 because they have to hire professional movers since they're so heavy. The county won't let employees move things that heavy. So the first three is $1,500 mm -hmm. and then the and then the rest is the, the thousand is the, the reinstall. Yeah, delivery. delivery storage. Now we have the drop boxes there currently 365 days a year, but I understand that currently anyway, we only open them for ballots 45 days ahead of time. So they're there 90 percent of the time sitting there, but they're locked. Yes. So rather than jackhammering drop boxes mm -hmm. out, would it be a feasible alternative simply to say this drop box is open 10 days before election? That's, so that's what I said. We can. Uh, so as so there are two options, removing them or reducing the days that they are open. So we could reduce the days they are open to only opening them for the last two weeks before an election for a cost savings of around two thousand dollars. OK, That's um, total across all nine boxes. Yes, total. so it's thirty five hundred dollars to do 45 days of all boxes. If we reduce it to just do 10 days, we would save around two thousand dollars. So it'd be around fifteen hundred dollars to do those last 14 days. But if I'm mailing my ballot in now, instead of putting it in the drop box, it costs you a dollar yep. in postage. So yep. you really, it's not. Yeah, you don't it's, know we're not we're not going to know. Right. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions I was also asked to address was the next slide, please. Um, any fraud or index? Sure. Yeah, before you leave this one, if I could just ask, um, ask uh, if you could help us refresh on our memory on the video feed. Um, uh, who uh, who takes that and where is it? Mm -hmm. I know it's in your office. <laughs> but for everybody here, where so, is it and to what extent is it viewed mm -hmm. and then to what extent is it kept? Mm -hmm. So um, the requirements for video feed, if you have a 24 hour Dropbox, um, part of the security requirements to have one is that it uh, it is monitored with video surveillance. So um, all the Dropboxes do have video surveillance on them. It is recorded. Uh, for the entire length that they are actively being used for that full 45 days and then the video is required to be stored for 30 days after the contest period for the election. So it has the same retention schedule as all the other materials for that election. Okay, thank you. 
in terms of when it is viewed. Um, so we don't we don't have somebody actively monitoring it 24 seven. Um, but uh, in addition to our staff, we will leave it up running in the office. Um, because it is entertaining to watch. Um, uh, but we also, um, so the watch desk here in Arlington, the 911 call center has access to those video cameras. And so the closer we get to an election, um, we notify the watch desk so that they can keep it in addition to their traffic cameras. They can have it, have our Dropbox cameras up so they're watching it as well. Does that make sense? Yes, thank yeah. you. That's helpful to know. Yeah. So um, I was also asked to address some of the election integrity concerns around drop boxes. Um, so I did review the Heritage Foundation's election fraud database for the last four years, um, looking at uh, fraud instances related to vote by mail. There were 15 instances of large scale ballot har harvesting, um, 18 instances of somebody returning a ballot for another individual. This was usually a family member or a deceased relative. And there were six instances of somebody voting multiple times in, a, in the same election. None of these cases involved drop boxes, from what I could tell. A review of news articles um, uncovered a handful of cases in which drop boxes were damaged, uh, proposing a security risk to voters who had chosen to use them. Um, there was one case in Washington State of a voter who, or sorry, a drop box that was hit by a car. Um, and there were a few cases of arson in Massachusetts and California. Um, in my review of the news, there is no exhaustive database of drop boxes that have been tampered with. But in my review, I could only find a handful of news articles that ever listed a drop box that had been tampered with. Um, and either way, both when we look at fraud and security, um, instances around drop boxes were rare. Uh, next slide, please. That, Christian, can I ask a question about the arson thing? Is that somebody trying to actually set the box on fire? Yeah. It would seem more you're trying to get at the ballots inside, take something, light it on fire, and put it in a box. Yeah. So it ignites the things inside. But yeah. I'm not giving anybody ideas, nor am I planning on. So, <laughs> so this yeah. leads me to my next slide, Dominique. Um, so <laughs> when we I, talk I, about. I, like yes. to say, Madam yes. Chair, uh, I saw, I remember seeing a news report showing the incident from California. That's exactly what was done. Yep. Um, it, the, the whole thing was lit on fire. Yeah. I, I assume that they're not really, they're, they're metals. So they, necessarily go up in flames and I assume there's so so I I am I am not a firefighter but fires generally need oxygen to exist and so when you put them in a box where there is no oxygen flow um, once again this is one of the things so when we talk about election security um, in elections we look at three things prevention detection and recovery so prevention and vote by mail, um, we do this um, by having weekly list of voters who have passed away in Virginia, um, requiring voters to attest that they are marking their ballot. And we only accept ballots from voters who have requested one. And we have a provisional ballot in place to prevent somebody from trying to vote multiple times over the course of an election if they've already received their mail ballot. When we talk about uh, uh, detection and breach and recovery from a breach. Um, I want to point out this is a um, USPS box. This is a picture somebody sent me last year of a box um, open in Clarendon um, and there were no postal employees in sight. So if we go back to 2020 and to the uh, instances at George Mason Post Office that were compromised, um, we have stories from voters that their ballots were lost. Um, USPS did not admit to that breach until the summer of 2021. We couldn't detect or recover from the breach because we didn't really know it was happening. We had stories, but we didn't have anything to go off of. Um, we didn't have video and we didn't know the timeframes of the breaches, so we couldn't notify voters that their ballots had potentially been lost. We didn't know anything. I did speak to Postal Inspection Services in January, 
and I asked what is the reasonable time frame to notify the public of when a Dropbox or USPS box has been compromised, they could not give me an answer. So there's no indication while the public should be notified that a post office has been. I'm not sure at what point in the investigation we would be notified that if you had used a box between a certain time frame that your mail might have been lost. Does that make sense? So um, I do have confidence in the post office to deliver mail ballots, um, but we are seeing and we will continue to see de delays in delivery st service standards. Um, this is across the board for the post office. Um, so standard first class mail delivery time frames is five to seven days. The days of getting your mail in two to three days in Arlington are gone and they are not coming back according to the post office. Um, so the post office did do a great job last year. Um, historically, we have seen service slip in non-federal years. It's really common for them to step up and do a great job in a federal year. And then we get to the primary six months later and they're back to where they were prior to that federal election year. Um, so in an off year election or smaller election, it's actually some are more challenging to work with the post office. Um, so next slide. Um, so interest in vote by mail continues to increase in Arlington. So I know that if you look at 2020 to today, you're going to see uh, what looks like a drop, but that's not really how we look at elections or how we look at data and elections. We look to we compare a like election to a like election because turnout in a presidential is just so much higher than any other election. So go to the next chart. So we like to stack um, presidential next to presidential, gubernatorial next to gubernatorial, um, mid-year to mid-year, and then uh, courts and constitutionals. So as you can see, um, we are still seeing a pretty significant jump from where we were four years ago. Um, we are starting to see things level off um, in large part um, because of that permanent absentee ballot mailing list. And I think that we will probably cap out with around 20% of our voters in Arlington choosing to vote by mail. Um, and they will make that choice to vote by mail with or without a drop box based on my experience. Okay. So I'd like to end with a quote that I found from Tammy Patrick. Um, Tammy Patrick is now at the Election Center, um, but she used to be the director in Maricopa County, Arizona. And then she went to the Democracy Fund. She was on the um, presidential task force following the 2012 election, 2012 election, and was um, anyway. So what Tammy says is that states that cut locations with all making it easy to vote by mail are setting up voters to fail rather than allowing the system to serve them. So with that, that is my presentation on drop boxes. So. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah. It was quite robust. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I'm curious, you said there were 59,000 mail ballots uh, done. I gather that most of them are done kind of at the same time when you when you send out the absentee ballots, although obviously yeah. somebody who sends it in late. Do you have a, a, a sense of what percentage of the voters who ask for absentee ballots claim that, that did not come to them in the mail that you have to send it out a second time is that we we keep track of reissues i don't have that number um i don't have and we don't keep track of why we're reissuing the ballot some will make it very clear that they're dog ate it in fact we've literally gotten ballots eaten by dogs back to us <laughs> so yeah because it, it does i mean you you know my general skepticism yeah. of having so many drop boxes yeah um it, it does seem to me that people who want to vote by mail, and I certainly want to encourage making that easy, by asking for voting by mail, <coughs> are expressing their faith that they will receive it in the mail, that the mails work, mm -hmm. and that really the principal purpose of drop boxes, which were instituted in 2020, was for people who didn't <coughs> have faith in mail. So there's kind of a, of a, a disconnect there that you have to believe in mail service enough to to um, uh, 
be faithful to, to believe you're going to receive the ballot, but not enough to think that the ballot you mail in will, in fact, be received by the uh, uh, by the election board. And obviously, that is a concern if you're mailing your ballot a couple of days before the election and mm -hmm. and uh, uh, having enough places for people to send their ballot during that period certainly makes sense to me. <coughs> John, yes. Yeah, John. Regarding the breach at uh, George Mason, did Representative Beyer or either of the senators weigh in on pushing the post office to get to the bottom of that more urgently? I am not aware. I what what we knew is we had voters, especially in the June and July elections, who told us they delivered their ballot to the drop box at the USPS at George Mason and their ballots never arrived. So they ended up having to vote curbside or on election day. And these were voters that did not want to vote in person during a pandemic. Um, so once again, we didn't have the, the post office never once notified us of a breach. Um, still to this day, they have never called us and said, hey, we think ballots were because what the people are breaking into these post office of uh, these boxes for checks. Ballots are just getting caught up in the mix. So they're not after they're not trying to commit voter fraud. We're just ballots are just getting lost in the process. So and I would say the difference between having a, like I said, using when we deliver ballots to the post office, we're, we could take them straight to the distribution center. We don't even go through a local post office. They are getting dropped at Maryfield or now the distribution center for our uh, vendor um, and they enter the mail stream. There is no chance of them being intercepted because um, they're not sitting outside of that mail service. So until they get to your post office box outside your house, that's the only time that in theory they could be intercepted. But now because voters have things like informed delivery where they can get an email of mail that's coming to their houses that day, there's a little bit more oversight and mail that's making it way their, it, their way to them. There's a little bit less so once again when they're trying to get their ballots back to us. Is, am I right? We do have a system that voters can check with you to see if your the, the ballot has yes. been received. Yes. I'm sure. Where is the regional distribution center for the vendor? It's in Albany, New York. Okay, thank you. Well, I can tell you this is anecdotal, but I remember um, taking Christmas cards up that year, and I didn't wind up mailing them because I attempted to open up, open up the, the lid to mail them, and it was um, there was mail that was pulling out, mm -hmm. and that was not good. Yeah, and I, I have spoken. It could have happened if it did happen, which it did in December of 2020. It could easily have happened in October or any time during the early voting. And I, I when I mail something, I tend to go somewhere else still these days. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm guessing that some of the people here are here to talk about drop boxes. Yeah, we, yeah. This might be an appropriate time to do public comment about yeah. that. So yes. if anybody wants to speak up, this might be a good time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have some copies. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Joan Port. I'm the president of the League of, League of Women Voters of Arlington and Alexandria City. The League supports the retention of the drop boxes in Arlington for all future elections. False claims of voter fraud in general and vote by mail in particular should not be the basis for any change in the number of our drop boxes. Of late, there have been numerous and widespread claims, some on network news shows, falsely stating that drop boxes, vote by mail, or absentee ballot voting are vehicles for mass voter fraud. The reality is that mail ballots have been successfully used in the United States for over 150 years and in that time, states have developed multiple layers of security to protect against malfeasance. According to the Brennan Center for Justice at the New York University of Law, voter fraud related to ballots and by mail or put in drop boxes is extremely rare. 
so great that multiple analysis have found that it is more likely that someone will be struck by lightning rather than voting fraudulently. By the way, it's less than one in a million chance that any of us will be struck by lightning. A recent study was commissioned by a candidate, 2020 candidate for the United States president and conducted by the Berkeley Research Group to look into alleged fraud in Georgia, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Arizona, and Nevada. The study found that there was no significant voter anomalies and no evidence of mass voting by deceased people or through the use of drop boxes and vote by mail, as was alleged. I will also note that this candidate's lawyer has recently been sanctioned for spreading voter fraud lies. Also, we know that even while anchors at a major news channel were stirring unfounded fraud fears, they knew that what they were saying was blatantly false, yet they perpetrated the myth of fraud. I asked how much longer will we allow the myth of fraud to disenfranchise voters and cause disruptions to our voting system? How many times do we have to be shown that our voting system is safe and the people who dedicate long hours to the sacred right of voting are honorable and fair? When will we stop the lie? Ballot drop boxes have been used for about two decades, according to Amber McReynolds, who is CEO of the National Vote at Home Institute and the former head of elections in Denver, Colorado. Denver is a state where all ballots are mailed to voters. The boxes are common in states where generally all voting is by mail, including Republican-led Utah. According to Justin Lee, Utah's director of elections, counties have been adding additional drop boxes almost every year since 2014. We have had no security problems and we have no indication that drop boxes favor one party over another. Drop boxes are generally more secure than standalone mailboxes. They weigh more than 600 pounds, have tamper-proof mechanisms. In Arlington, they have two locks in addition to video surveillance. They are tamper-proof, bomb-proof, fireproof, and in many places equipped with cameras or located near government officials, according to Wendy Weisner, a voting rights as expert at the Brennan Center. Quote, they have more security features than mailboxes do, and they are opened only by qualified workers. And as was mentioned here, an SUV crashed into a box in Washington State last year, and both the box and the contents were unscathed. In Arlington, ballots are picked up by two election officers who carry a bag which is locked for which they have no key. Ballots are dropped into a slot in the bag. Both officers count the number of ballots picked up at each site and verify the numbers. The bag is not opened until they are returned to the elections office and then by a third per person. Also, every ballot must be enclosed in a ballot return envelope and is coded for voter authentication. Can I say that word? Authentication. <laughs> I can't say baccarudo. Instead of worrying about virtually non-existent voter fraud, we should strengthen safeguards around our election system and protect election officials and poll workers who have been under increasing threat for doing their jobs just because of the myth of fraud. A 2020 survey of local election officials found that one in three knew of one or more election workers who have been left, they left their job, at least in part due to security concerns, and one in five who say themselves may not serve through 2024. We are not a democracy if poll workers are threatened and citizens are needlessly disenfranchised from voting. If we have learned nothing since January 6, 2021, we know that American democracy is fragile. There is also the myth of expense, that it is too expensive to process these votes. However, with increased use and not decreased use, these expenses, which are small to, to, to begin with, will go down. Decreasing the number of boxes to allow only those remaining in the most white, most conservative parts of the county will only increase the cost of collection. It is also a slap in the face for the fair and equitable access to voting for all, not just those of privilege. Removing and storing drop boxes is expensive and a useless proposition. What long-term value is served by removing a form of voting that is increasing nationwide? Shuttering drop boxes for periods of time will lead to voter confusion and further disenfranchisement. We also add know that now they save money because they will save a dollar uh, in mail fees. The League of Women Voters will, all, has always held that voting should be more accessible to all eligible Americans, not less. 
Drop boxes are just one tool. They are a mechanism that helps those who have difficulty finding time to vote, such as people with two jobs or who work long hours like teachers and doctors. More education is needed to show voters that drop boxes are safe and viable and a great resource for busy voters and they save money. We encourage Arlington County to maintain all drop boxes and to conduct an educational program so that the voters are aware of the safe vote avenue for voting. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Sean. Yes, Frank. Uh, yes, hi everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Thanks for the discussion. Um, I, I had two points. One was the, I don't know if they did the option of just leaving the drop boxes there and, and uh, or and like uh, locking <clears throat> six of them, just keeping them locked all year. I mean, without removing them, just throwing that out as another option, which would save the cost of, uh, of, uh, and, of taking them out. But the other thing, and I think um, the discussion and the analysis so far, it hasn't put a lot of emphasis on this, on the sense of, of, of confidence uh, in the voting process. And I would say specifically among conservative voters. So I think it's fair to say, and this is for right or for wrong. I'm not saying that the justifications are right or wrong, but the large majority of conservative voters in, in the country are suspicious of drop boxes. Again, not saying for right or wrong, but that's definitely the case. And so that actually detracts from a strong sense of confidence among that segment of the population in the voting process. So, I mean, if we bring that to Arlington, okay, there's, I don't know, maybe, maybe 20, 25 percent, maybe uh, people would be would consider themselves conservative, but those people also would share would have would have strong reservations about drop boxes again detracting from their confidence in the voting process so you know in that case if if the drop boxes in arlington i would say especially the six that only get a few ballots per day um, uh, if they provide a, a a limited benefit to the voters um then uh, the question then is, is, is it really worth it to have that ongoing sense of perhaps a, a reduction of the sense of confidence uh, in the voting process among that the popular, the conservative uh, voters? So that's um, my point about that. So thank you. Thank you. Carol, then Dominique, then Bonnie. Order of hand, sorry. Yes. <laughs> Um, I have two comments. For one, well, Frank, the 75% of the Democrats like the drop boxes compared to your 20% who are afraid they're not confident in them. I think you would find that the 75% of Arlingtonians are very confident in those boxes. So uh, I would go with the majority there. Um, on costs, the people who go and pick them up are regular staff members, right? Yes. So you're not, they're not added costs. $76 a day is not an added cost. These people are on your staff anyway. There is an, yes, you're correct. They are, they are on our staff anyway. Um, like I said, we're generally have employees that we bring in just to do the Dropbox run or um, like I'll put Connie on the spot. She is one of our Dropbox. Um, collectors and which so a lot of times when she finishes her run then we'll shift her over to doing some other duties so it's not so yes they are staff members i will say uh because we do have to pick up the boxes once a day um and we're not open on a lot of saturdays or sundays or holidays we're still picking up drop boxes on those days so there is um if we just look at the extra days that we're bringing staff members in um, I think that was around a $700 cost for those extra Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays. Which may well be um, saved by the dollar. You don't have to pay for it being returned by the not very highly confident U.S. <laughs> Postal Service. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I would trust your drop boxes. And, and I will say the reason we use employees is because I'm um, 
we uh, use an Arlington County vehicle to, and that's a part of to uh, make sure that we're maintaining confidence in this process. Um, that's one of the things I would never negotiate it on. I'm never going to have a personal vehicle pick up drop boxes. So they're going around in an Arlington County vehicle, which means they have to be Arlington County employees to be authorized to drive that vehicle. So, um, sorry. I'm going to sit in the middle here for a second. Um, people who have seen me at previous meetings, I, I'm going to expressly disagree with one of the board members and with with Frank. I don't care about the drop boxes. I think some of the hyperbole and conflation that was in your report could have been removed to make a better impression on the 25%. I don't think the 25% should be dismissed, but I also think there's something on us, some of us, maybe not all of us, to improve the confidence rather than responding to your, I, I don't think you're wrong in saying that they're unfounded concerns in a lot of respects. So we should be educating the people to have more confidence in, you're never going to get rid of everybody, but um, to improve things rather than take away from things. I think there's something that needs to be made clear. Drop boxes are not equivalent to mail balloting. Not everyone that dislikes drop boxes has the same concern about mail ballots in general. Um, I don't think it's correct to say that whereas there is little evidence that drop boxes are a concern of themselves, there is a concern with mail balloting. Um, and part of the concern is that it is becoming wider spread. That yes, mail ballots have been used forever, but when you go from having, say, 2% of voters using them to 22% of voters using them, you definitely are, are increasing by orders of magnitude the possibility of problems, be they intentional or unintentional. So, I, I mean, my issue is, I don't think, I, I agree in that respect, it's very hard to do a, a strict cost, cost benefit on drop boxes because I don't think it, you can't dollar about the benefit the convenience benefit, the voter, the voter side is not monetizable if the same way that the cost side is monetizable. So, because um, like I said, like uh, one thing that should probably be watched on both sides is when this becomes an entirely partisan issue, where the 75% is on one side, the 25% is on the other, nothing anybody does will will work it will just strictly be a pure majoritarian force thing and then I, you just can't you can't proceed because what you wind up is we do something here in arlington the folks in southwest virginia do the exact opposite thing just to balance out what they think is going on in northern virginia um maybe irrationally i, I don't like using that word can I can I ask a question? Because this is one of the things I've had trouble understanding. Okay. Yeah. Um, because I agree with you, there is a lot of um, uh, so a lot of the complaints about drop boxes are really about the vote by mail process as a whole, and it's just drop boxes. It, it seemed to have become the focus on attacking vote by mail. Is that a correct statement? In some respects, I also think that for some people, and I am not now speaking for anybody else that has anything to do with the Republican side of this argument, um, is that when you start talking about vote by mail, and you start talking about what can be done, you get very quickly to, it's got to go to Richmond. It's got to go to Richmond. Mm -hmm. It's got to go to Richmond. Yeah. All of these rules are either federal law or state law, yeah. um, and not things that are within the control of the board, of the registrar, of the county board, of anybody here. Okay. So I think this is a place where we do, we meaning Arlington, the local has control governing authority of, has, yes. has on this specific issue. Yes. yes, like you under the code can decide that there are going to be, there's going to be like Fairfax, one box or nine boxes or a box on every street corner. Yeah. Um, whereas all of the other problems with mail voting that mail mail balloting that people see, ballot harvesting, 
legal, can't be made illegal in Arlington, has to be made illegal in Richmond. Um, problems, uh, I know that some people would like to see that instead of in lieu of a witness signature, that that last four and date of birth is the, you know, and witness signatures are just, you know, tossed entirely. Again, that's a state law thing. Um, rules about returning ballots and, and the permanent absentee list and all of those things are legislative, not regulatory. No, that they can't be done at the left, they can't be done here. So no, that helps understand, helps me understand. I, I think that people do tend to focus a little bit on things that are within, you know, within their control mm -hmm. um, or easier to control than, you know, particularly at the, the present moment where we know that anything that has some partisan tinge to it will go nowhere in Richmond because of the way that the legislature is currently constructed. Um, yeah. And won't change until at least next year. Yeah, and I did forget to say, um, in our comparison of across the regional comparison, um, at some point Loudon actually had 13 staffed drop boxes at each of their libraries in the county. Um, but because they had to pay somebody to sit there with the drop box for the hours the library was open, um, that they did that they did eliminate that. I think it was last year. I think they did it last oh, year. So they didn't have like drop boxes like the big they, ones. They, they had, had like, I think they bag, had like, one. Yeah, so they the equivalent of but yeah, so they were staffing a like monitor drop box at all of their libraries. Um, but that just became too. So when you look at Arlington County with its nine 24 hour drop boxes, there were at times more drop boxes available in other localities. But because we made the investment in nine with that federal funding and the other localities didn't at the time. Um, Henrico is the only location in Virginia I know that has more than one. I could be wrong on that though, but they have five and that's one for each magisterial district. And that's once again, they didn't want to show preference on which magisterial district got a Dropbox, so they all got a Dropbox. So, yeah. Let me just say that I fully agree with your concern that we not uh, have voting be more accessible to some members of the community than others. And certainly, um, you know, I would be uh, very interested in hearing people's ideas as to the, the most equitable way of distributing opportunities for uh, uh, for early voting and for for drop boxes around the county. Um, so uh, I think your point is well taken and I certainly agree. Thank you. And may I just respond quickly? Uh, Connie, did I? I, yeah, I just have one comment. Um, I think people might hesitate to put their, their last birth, their social and their birth date on a ballot that they thought might go through the mail. And I think drop boxes would help alleviate that concern people would have. So the drop boxes might be used more once that becomes law. And so what, and what, so, so I'm gonna give my German answer to that, yeah, um, which is both yes and no. Um, so, um, so in Arlington, uh, the, the statement of voter and all that information is placed in a exterior envelope. And um, a lot of our neighboring localities, they actually have the statement of voter and signature on the exterior envelope so that it would be visible as it gets passed through the postal system. So, and I think if people were concerned about the security of the mailboxes in that case, then yeah, in that case, the drop boxes would be a better option. Yeah, I mean, it's just Somebody their perception. At, at the left and I don't know if that's <laughs> the right thing about what, what are best. Well, it's just an option. Um, so, our, no, I'm, I'm so the, the mail ballot envelopes that we use are approved by the <laughs> Department of Elections. But a lot of um, it's there's a lot of different reasons for why you go. One, we're going into the weeds. There's a lot of like, are you going to be a four ballot, a uh, three, uh, sorry, four envelope, three envelope, or two envelope <laughs> system? And there's a lot of uh, discussion in how many envelopes. Um, we were in 2020 on a five envelope system. I'm mm. um, in the midst of a paper shortage, which is <laughs> making everything more. Is that counting both the out and the. the mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's how you'd have five. It's the out and the in, the security envelope, and then the ballot is sent and closed in a security envelope. As somebody who works in precinct, I have gotten that sealed envelope. Anyway, so.
just want to say, yeah. if I may, I agree with you on education. I don't agree with you on the hyperbole because I, nothing I said is hyperbole. And we are nonpartisan. I don't care if 75 Democrats or 75 Republicans. And if you don't believe me, I will be happy to tell you the screaming matches I had last year with Democrats over redistricting who <laughs> were in my face and on my phone calling the League of Women Voters every wrong name because we were taking away their authority to redistrict as they wanted. So believe me, we get it from both sides and that's the way it should be. Um, so I don't, I don't care if 100% of the people are still a little bit skittish about this. But our whole goal is make voting easier, safe, and stop with the nonsense. You know, people need to use drop boxes just like they need to vote by mail because not everybody can get to the polls on that day. And that's that's our whole goal is to make it easier for every eligible citizen. That's it. All right, thank you. This was um, this was actually a really great discussion. Um, so thank you all very much for participating in this. Um, I am going to just um, say that I am for keeping the drop boxes. I think based on our population, it makes sense. The question now becomes um, the hours, right? Like how, how, how do we do this moving forward? We know the expense in pulling them out, putting them back in, storing them, and, and to me that it just doesn't make sense to have that additional expense every four years. Um, so Scott and Rich, I'm going to ask you to chime in as well on this. Well, I, I, I think I made it clear that I think that we ought to make voting easy for all voters in Arlington and you know, you also represent Alexandria where they have one. Are you pushing for nine in Alexandria or? <laughs> if they wanted to do nine in Alexandria, Alexandria is even smaller than we are, but um, if they wanted more, we would push for more. We have made presentations on that as well but to make sure they're kept. And, and I mean, I, I have never supported the idea of totally getting rid of drop boxes. I think they ought to be an option available for people, but we already have so many options, including putting your ballot in the mail, um, and that uh, uh, I'm, I'm just not sure that, that uh, um, nine is really something that, that um, um, we need, particularly since we already have, how many precincts, 55 do we have? Or 54. 54, every precinct has a drop box on election day. Every early voting site has a monitored drop box while they are open, so that uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not convinced that uh, um, is necessarily the best way to be spending our money. I don't think that it uh, causes massive fraud. There's absolutely no evidence of that. I do think that, uh, um, uh, that there are people who don't like uh, uh, drop boxes, just like there are people who don't like mailing because they have a real fear of, of the mail service, but that we need to to, to uh, have some sort of uh, happy medium on this, and I'm not sure nine is necessarily the happy medium. Thank you, Madam Chair and Vice Chair. I, uh, as I expressed earlier in reference to the number of locations for early voting, it certainly is appropriate to consider what's needed in a given year. Just the same as we consider how many election officials we appoint and then in turn we should consider how many are needed given what's on the ballot, be it for the primary or be it for the general election. So I think it, it's always good to take a look at what makes sense at a given time and certainly having having accessibility. Um, again, as I expressed last month, certainly having a geographical distribution is very important so no one can think whatsoever that there's any even though we're the smallest county in the country, along with one in New Jersey, I don't want to have anybody think that there's not an accessibility to vote. So it's a unique situation where it's General Assembly enacted this in its wisdom, so it's a matter for the, for the Director of Elections to consider 
again, I think it's always important to consider every year what makes sense under those circumstances, what's on the ballot. Sometimes it may be more, sometimes it may be less. What makes sense in this year when we have more candidates on the ballot than any year, but it's the smallest turnout. The turnout is small. Next year we have among the fewest number of candidates on the ballot, but it's the largest turnout. And so I think an equitable geographical distribution is important. Um, and again, it, it may make sense that the may make sense that uh, three to three makes sense this time next year as you suggested which last year could could make sense and be back to nine the general assembly uh, might decide that this the drop box statute will be repealed mm -hmm. uh, the house of delegates uh probably should have mentioned before the house of delegates did vote to yep. eliminate them and the senate the senate didn't and so i think we'll have a sense as to what likely is, is going to happen in 2024 based on the outcome of November's elections. But in the meantime, again, action by us, action by the director of election to consider what is equitable, what is fair, what is appropriate in this year of 2023 is, is appropriate to consider in all respects with regard to everything we do. I hope those thoughts are helpful. <laughs> Um, so uh, once again, so when we talked about reducing the number of them, uh, when we look at cost savings, that it really was negligible because, like I said, it doesn't matter how many times you stop, if you're having to drive from the south end to the north end of Arlington, it's going to cost, it's, it just takes that long to drive from the north end to the south end. There's only so many, unless you're on one of the fast roads where you can get there in 15 minutes, you're easily looking at a an hour and a half long trip is when we've done when we've mapped it out and done the runs to test it how long does it take to just do if we just did courthouse madison and walter reed it's really not that much longer to just go do the full circuit so so cost savings is the if we cost are the issue reducing the number doesn't doesn't seem to impact costs that much so the question is really reducing the days or removing them all together. Um, I'll also note that the, the election that we are immediately talking about is a democratic primary election. Um, this is an election that we have been asked to run essentially for by the Democratic Party. Um, and I would be interested in hearing from the chair um, since this is an election that we are, that this is their election that we are running. So. I think that's fair, Madam mm -hmm. Chair. And, and sorry, the chair of the party. Yeah, yeah. no, I know. <laughs> I, know, I, know. I, know. I just it just occurred to me. I was like, no, no, I, know, I know, I know, I know exactly you knew, you knew who you were yeah, talking sure. about. Yeah. Um, I, what I can do is I can have Steve get in touch with yeah. you. So he was hoping to make it today, but he just wasn't able to. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. And obviously, every election we have more information as to how popular these drop boxes are. We'll have another sense after June as to yeah. uh, as to what the trend is. Yeah. yeah. That's very appropriate. I have a question. Yes. Are you making a decision that will affect the primary election or the general election election coming up or just in general? Whatever decision you make today. Which election are you? Well, I think we've all understand that the decision is Gretchen's ultimately um, and we can give her advice and my understanding from what I'm hearing is that this is the sort of decision that goes election by election yeah. based on what we find. Similar to our early voting hours, like I said, we'll we adjust them based on the type of election and then and I'd like to say that if the tables were reversed and this were a Republican primary, my I would be hoping to hear from the Republican chair. Um, and Madam Chair, that could be a consideration with respect to the to next year. Yeah. Um, even if the General Assembly were to, <coughs> pardon me, even if the General Assembly were to repeal the Dropbox statute, it would not be presumably effective until, until after the until presidential primary, yeah. July first. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they can pass up pass a measure with an emergency clause, but that takes a super. Or get likely, but that just makes makes that point 
that you could be considering, uh, uh, depending on, on how many candidates are on. It's a dual primary, and both parties have it that that adds adds a further considerations. But again, what what we're your point is 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 well taken, and it's an election by election situation. That was that was why I mentioned how many election officials do we need? Mm -hmm. How many early voting locations do we need? How many ballots do we need to print? It all varies. And so I think that, I think that certainly <coughs> we're being very respectful, but also being respectful of the General Assembly's enactment of the statute, giving the decision to the Director of Elections, but also giving her all our best thoughts and the options to consider again what makes sense given these particular circumstances on this ballot in 2023. Yes. Hope that clarifies. Thank you. And I'll see you. You. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So I think the next steps, um, Gretchen, is I, I need to have Steve talk to you. Mm -hmm. um, they, they will be seeing him on the 20th, just because that's when campaign planning Okay. Let's see if he can talk to you soon. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 All right. <clears throat> so now I'm going to ask if there are any more public comments on any other issues. And again, I thank everyone for their input in this really good discussion. Um, you know, and just it's it's interesting because I think we got to the root of what the issue is, and that is the concern over the mail balance, right? That's really I think what it is. And Dominique, as you said, it's something when you have control over something. It's kind of it's easier to, to focus on that mm -hmm. than to focus on the things that you don't have control over. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. I, I would hope that we would ask our leaders to weigh in on any doubt that we have about about proper handling of ballots, whether it's by Dropbox or by mail. If we have credible information about ballots being mishandled, I would hope that the board and our elected officials in Congress would weigh in and support us in getting to the bottom of that. I yes. hope that they would be asked to. <laughs> well, yes, you, yes, yes, you make a good point. Um, in the summer, uh, like I said, if we go back to 2020, all we had were anecdotal. We didn't know anything was going on. It's like all you have are next door rumors, essentially. Um, and they did turn out they were they were the real. It really was happening, but it took a year for the community to be notified. And and I, that's a frustration for anybody who serviced out of that George Mason post office. I, I don't I, I don't know enough about federal law on this, but are, are there any rules governing the post office about notifying anybody, local officials? Like like I would think that if, if anybody wants to write their congressman. Um, <laughs> that I, some sort of law requiring the post office, particularly at an election season, that a post office has to notify someone that a breach has occurred. I mean, we get all over Facebook and Twitter and, and anybody yeah. at the bank, anybody who has a data breach, yeah. they're required to report it yeah, this is true. Like within yeah. days so that people know that their data has been breached. They think that it's fair that yeah. the ballots are in the mail, like are well, out there. Checks. Yeah. If, if mail is being yeah. stolen from a post office box, the community should be alerted to if they delivered mail between this time frame and this time frame. Mm -hmm. 
They, it, but so, and then expecting a check in this week, and you yeah. well, the box was broken into. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you may not get your check. And like I said, I had an informal conversation with some inspectors at an event I was at in January, and they, if there is a law, they were not aware of it, and they did not indicate that there was a standard time frame for notifying the public of an active investigation. And these, these were the people in charge of doing investigations. So that's crazy. Uh, needs to get in and Frank has his, Frank has his hand up. Oh, yes. Mute Don. Sorry. Yep. Hi. hi. Yep. I just thought, I, and I apologize if this was uh, addressed earlier. I got a little bit late, but is there going to be, have you scheduled a, a logic and accuracy testing for the upcoming June primary yet? And because. Uh, of course, we would like to participate, and it seems like it's, it'll be a very interesting one because it will it'll be a testing also of the, the process of the ranked choice voting. Are we entitled to participate? Yeah, so to answer, Frank, no, we did not schedule the logic and accuracy testing for the Democratic primary. Um, and because it is a Democratic primary and primary candidates and their campaign representatives can attend logic and accuracy testing, um, but they aren't generally made of it open to the public. So that would be, yeah, a conversation that would need to be had, so. I'd like to increase that conversation because I remember the league used to be able to go to those and now it seems to be open just to the parties. Yeah, well, legally it's always been open to the parties. Okay. So. Open it to the public. I would just yeah. like to make a pitch. We'd like to be back. What we, what we do intend to do, um, for everybody in the room is obviously logic and accuracy testing for ranked choice voting is for, this is um, our election enthusiasts slash nerds. Um, so uh, we do plan on highlighting the topic of logic and accuracy testing and really doing a deep dive into what that process will look like. So whether it's an open public process or just open to the candidates, uh, we will be uh, providing information on that process. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you. Yes, thank you all very much. Okay. All right. So, um, we actually do need to go into closed session. Um, you all are welcome to sit here. It is. We have some peach pie. <laughs> it is seven forty-two. Seven twelve. Oh, thank you. Because I can't see. Right now. No, you're fine. Um. So, I move that the electoral board go into closed session pursuant to state code section two point two dash three seven one one. Dash A thirty five for the purpose of discussing the issues related to the local election standards. I second. All in favor? Aye. aye. The is gonna be in there. <laughs>
So we're going to come out the closed session. So um, it is 7.33. I move that the Electoral Board return to public session and certify that only public business matters lawfully exempt from open meeting requirements by Virginia law and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convene, convening the closed the closed session were heard, discussed, or considered. I second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. And now I'm going to move that we adjourn the meeting at 7.34 p.m. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.